tunes that we've introduced recently into the, uh, the, the song set. Such good words, huh? Rich words. I mean, just that, that bridge, your kindness has led us to repentance. We don't sing about repentance a lot, do we? Uh, we think of repentance as that guy on the corner holding the sign saying, repent, the end is near, right? But uh, repentance is an important part of our journey as, as followers of Christ. So good to see you. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 and uh, appreciate you guys being a loving community and understanding community. I thought it was ironic as Ryan was up here talking about the need for tech helpers. Uh, we didn't have any of the words going on with PowerPoint <laughs> up here. And then the last song, we got it dialed in. So uh, Ryan scrambled, Josh was scrambling, um, Jared was scrambling. So, um, so second service, we'll know nothing about the tech issues we had first service. So uh, good to see you guys. First John chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, did we have that slide, Jared, on there? No, it's not on there? Okay. So I took a picture. So my wife and I had date day on Friday. Back to date days. Yay! I'm a little happier camper, aren't I? You know, so we got date days. Usually date day is me picking her up from, from school uh, where our kids are at. She teaches chapel, and then we go to a movie and go out to lunch and run errands together. It's a lot of fun. So we're at Santan Village. You know, we're slumming it on that side of town on Friday. And I'm walking into Santan Village into the movie theater, and there's this huge sign as I'm heading into the mall that says Code of Conduct. And literally, it must have been like four-point font on this sign that probably had no less than a million words on it, Code of Conduct, and it's like a dissertation. I'm like, I'm going to the mall. I don't have time to read this. And yet, I took a picture of it because I thought it was fascinating that they had to post a code of conduct so that they made sure everyone knew how to behave themselves. Number one, I'm wondering who's stopping to read this so that they know how to behave in an orderly fashion at Santan Village. And then secondly, I'm going, why the need? Why the need for the code of conduct? I'm glad they didn't have a place you had to sign off on it in order to walk through the, the outdoor mall that is Santan Village. But I have it on my phone if you're interested in looking after the service. It's fascinating. I didn't read through it because I don't have time to, to do that kind of stuff. But I'm going, do we really need a code of conduct posted? Are we at a place as a people that we don't know how to conduct our lives? Now, some of you are going, in light of recent events, perhaps we need this. Do we really need to learn how to behave ourselves, how to lead a life in an orderly fashion, how to treat one another, how to show respect for one another? Maybe maybe we do need more codes of conduct posted. But I'm going to be the guy that argues that, you know what? God has written these laws on our heart. And deep down inside, we know that there's a better way to conduct ourselves. There's this thing called conscience that we all have inside. And I wonder, have we come to a point as a people where maybe our consciences are seared? We've lost sight of the ultimate objective, and that is, I believe, to love God and love others. And could it be that the words of Jesus, write this down, Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. Here's what Jesus says. When lawlessness increases, people's love will grow cold. We're seeing lawlessness increase. I'm sure 2,000 years ago when Jesus said this, he saw it running rampant. We have not changed. Perhaps we're exposed to more of it. It's in our laps. It's in our faces. It's on our devices. It's all over. And I think there's the temptation to say, you know what? I'm done. There's so much lawlessness abounding. You know what? I've just grown apathetic. I've grown complacent. What can I do? And and, and we want a hall pass. Like we don't now have to contribute to, the, 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 to our role in the culture. And, and I'm here to plead with you this morning, not just in light of recent events, 
But I'm here to plead with you, I hope, the, the message of God that we are in a place where we can't afford to let our love grow cold. Okay? Because while last week we talked about the essence of the Christian life being obedience to God, today the goal of the Christian life is to grow as, in our love as, as, as we grow and understand God's love for us will grow in our love for Him and for others. Your job is to grow in love as, God's, as God loves. That's the aim. And I'm not going to post a, a million-word code of conduct for you this morning. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy for that? But here's what I do want you to write down. If I was to sum up the message of John this morning uh, from where we've already been, he would tell you the Christian life is about three things. Up to this point, it's about three things. We started 1 John and we looked at knowing Christ, number one. The Christian life is first and foremost about knowing Christ, an intimate relationship with Jesus. Number two, he would say the, 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 the Christian life is about obeying God. So knowing, which leads to obeying, is critical to understanding the journey of, of faith in Jesus. But then we come to the, la- the, the, the third point, which I think we're going to unpack this morning, I know we're going to unpack, is this, love for others. If you know Christ, obey God, and love others, you, ladies and gentlemen, have fulfilled God's design for your life. There's your code of conduct. I don't know if Santan Village would be interested in posting that, right? Know Christ, obey God, love others. But it's that loving others that we're going to talk about this morning. And it's an important topic because we have a responsibility as we say we love Jesus, to love this world. And it's easy to love our enemies, amen? I mean, easy to love our friends, but not so easy to love our enemies, amen? You guys were really eager to say, I love my, I love my friends, not love my enemies, right? But the, the true proof of your love is loving those that are not like you, loving those that are different from you, loving those who disagree with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we come to a test this morning. Last week was the obedience test. This week is the social test. How do you love other people? Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Look at verses 7 through 11. Beloved, I'm not writing to you a new commandment, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness And does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So we need to talk about love. And it is a topic that is frequently batted about in our culture. Songs have been written about it. Movies have been made about it. Books have been written on it. We've experienced it for better or for worse. Better to have loved and to have and lost than to have never Loved at all, right? There's something that in our, our makeup, how God's designed us, we are to be a, we're to be loving creatures. And yet, it is one of the most difficult things to do in a biblical sort of way. Let me, let me unpack this. The meaning of love. There are really four words for, for love that go back thousands of years. And I'm not going to go into them in, in, in depth, but there are four words. If you want to read a great book, C.S. Lewis, The Four Loves, is an amazing book to read. Um, there is storge love. No need to, these are Greek words, so I'm just, just sharing with you my, my seminary education because I need to justify my, my payment to the school somehow, some way. Storge love is a general love for art, creation. It's an appreciation for Things that you see, you know, you say, oh, I love that painting. I love that forest. That's a, that's a general kind of love for, for creation. But then there's an eros 
love. This is the second love. Eros, where we get the word erotic. Where do you think this love is headed? It is a sensual love. It is a romantic love. This is a, a love that says, you know what? I'm physically connected to another person. And so this is all part of God's wonderful design. So you got the storge, you got eros, you got phileo love. Where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of, you guys are amazing. Brotherly love, this idea that there can be a, a love that's shared between friends. And we need this kind of love because we build relationships with people. And so we've got storge, eros, phileo. But the love that the Bible puts a premium on and talks about more than any other kind of love is the word agape love. Some of you may have heard the term agape. Some of you may have heard the term and have no clue what it means. You get some that have grown up in the church that like throwing the word agape all around. You're just like, what are they even talking about? What is this? Well, I'm going to tell you why agape love is important. I'm going to tell you why um, this is the love that we are to practice because it originates in the heart of God because God is love. And he's designed us to be uh, in his image. And one of the ways we share this, this quality with God is how we love others. And I'm going to tell you what's key about this love. is It's an unconditional love. It's a love that has no strings attached to it. It's a love that says, you know what, it is unselfish in nature. It is a love that gives and expects nothing in return. It's a love that puts the needs of other people before your own. See, as I define the word love and, and unpack it for you, we all understand how we fall short of this kind of love. Because the love we tend to practice, the love we tend to experience, is a very selfish love, isn't it? I mean, I meet with couples who are thinking about getting married. I meet with couples who have already been married. And I'll tell you what, the number one problem most couples have with each other is the topic of selfishness. And if you don't understand how God wants to weed out the sin of selfishness, don't get married. But he'll use another avenue to teach you this lesson. And if you don't learn in marriage, once you're married, he'll bring you kids. And then you'll learn how, how selfish you are, right? But it is a very giving, unconditional, selfless kind of love, exactly the kind of love God has shown us because, boy, think about how God has, has loved us. Do you deserve the love of God? No. And yet he's given it to you. And once you receive it, aren't you amazed that he hasn't taken away his love? based upon how you've acted, how you've behaved, and yet God does not withdraw his love based upon your performance. It is, an, it is not a love based on condition. And yet he says to us, his creatures, I want you to love others as I have loved you. Matter of fact, the one verse you can't get away from, and we're going to be talking about this morning frequently, John chapter 13, verses 34, 35, John 13, 34, Jesus says this to his disciples. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you and the world will know you are my disciples by your love for each other. Think about this. A new commandment I give you. This is the night Jesus would be betrayed. He leaves his disciples with this last word. Here's the commandment I want you to follow. Love each other as I have loved you. And the world's going to know that you're mine by your love for one another. I mean, think about how much is riding on this. Now, if you think about the disciples, and we're going to talk about them in a minute, what a risk. <laughs> what an amazing act of trust, right? But yet, Jesus is the Son of God, I know that. But if God can work in the lives of those men and other people that Jesus ministered to, boy, he can use us. There's hope. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for you, all right? There's hope for me, all right? Amen? So, the meaning of love, this idea of agape love, and I'm going to tell you right now that the love that is required of us and expected of us, as we live in the times we live in right now that are very difficult and trying and it's hard to express this kind of unconditional love to people, I'm not talking about love that's based on your feelings. I am talking about a love that requires will, that de requires determination, and requires an insane amount of love and grace. 
okay? You're to love all people. All people. A-L-L. All means all, and that's all all means, and that's all I'll say about that, all right? So, two things as we look at these two last points. Number one, there is the manner of love. And lastly, there is the, let me look at my notes, measure of love. You knew it had to be an M, right? Well, get ready for the E's because they're coming at you, all right? The manner of love, John says, is both old and both new. Here's the interesting thing. You would think, because John's in his 80s, is he wrestling with senility at this point? Because you're reading verses 7 and 8 and going, an old commandment I give you, not a new one, but no, I do give you a new one, but not an old one. What's he saying? Has he he got like Dr. Seuss disease? What's going on with John here? And yet he says something very intriguing. It's, It's both old and both new, and I want you to write this down. It's old in the sense that, boy, it's been with creation from the very beginning. I mean, God set Adam and Eve up to love one another. And, and most importantly, for them to love God. But yet, at the very beginning, Genesis 3, you see the violation of them not loving God by disobeying Him. So right there, Genesis 3, the violation of, of loving God. Boom. And then in chapter 4, Cain killing his brother Abel. Right? The first murder in the Bible, a violation of loving one another, now is committed in Genesis 4. We're just starting this thing. And God cries out and says, where's Abel? And Cain responds, am I my brother's keeper? Right? I mean, right here, the beginning of creation, men, women, the earth, we are on a trajectory towards failure. We, we are not loving God. We're not loving each other. And you wonder just like, why didn't God just pull the plug right then and there? Yet he chose to love this world unconditionally and put up with rebellious violators like you and I. And so John says, this has been hardwired into humanity from the beginning, but you can even go to Moses, Leviticus chapter 19. Moses says, you have responsibility to love your neighbor. But I think ultimately what John's referring to is is the message of Jesus. John chapter 13, right? This new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And so what I believe John's saying is it's not new in time this is a new in quality kind of love you ever seen a a package for something you really enjoy and they say new and improved i wonder how it can be new and improved at the same time that's another topic for another time but hey you've taken something that we're familiar with but we've improved it it's new in quality and so john is going to say There is a new in quality kind of love that Jesus has left with us. And there's really three things we need to unpack under this point of the manner of love. Because ultimately, Jesus is the model of love. He's not just the revelation of love. He's the source of love. So we can't get by without looking at Jesus. And there's three things I want you to look at. Number one, there's a new emphasis. Number two, there's a new example. And number three, there's a new experience. Oh, the E's don't end there. Trust me. You're, you guys are in for a treat this morning. So the new emphasis is this. You love one another as Christ has loved us. If you, if you grow cold or blind or deaf or dumb to the ways Jesus has loved us, You will not grow in godly love. You will grow in a calloused hardening of your heart and hate others. So the emphasis is always to look to Jesus as he has loved us, which leads us to our second point, this example. We have a new example. Here's what's so amazing about the ministry of Jesus is now we have a picture on how to love. Don't you love that when Jesus came on the scene, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. We are no longer left to guessing. We have the visible picture of the love of God and not just embodied, but fleshed out and executed in Jesus. First Peter chapter two says, Jesus has left us an example to walk in his steps. If someone asks me, 
boil down the Christian life to one sentence, it would be this, to walk as Jesus walked. There's our template. There's our, there's our model. There's our example. You don't need to go any further than the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so there's the example, and I want you to think about Jesus' life, because there are, it is like a carnival of characters that weave in and out of Jesus' life. And how he put up with people, how he he pressed on in relationship with people, uh, is amazing. I mean, think about the disciples, right? There was Peter, who was impetuous, right? Always putting his foot in his mouth, always trying to step in the way of God's will. And you just wonder at times, like, did, did Jesus just not want to accidentally push them off the cliff when they were walking during, a, during story time or something? I mean, and then you've got James and John. Don't think these guys are, like, all about love because they're called the sons of thunder because they are jockeying for position in the kingdom of God. I mean, so there's pride. Then you've got, you know, Thomas, who's questioning, who's skeptical, who's doubting. Um, You've got uh, this this band of renegades that Jesus just puts up with and shows them up. Judas, I mean, here's the very one Jesus knew would betray him. This is the one who would turn him over to the authorities that would thus begin a journey to the cross. And yet, did not Jesus love him? And then you've got the woman who's been married five times and sleeping with a guy she's not married to, and he loves her. And you've got the woman who's hemorrhaging uncontrollably, and she touches the cloak of Jesus, and he loves her. And you've got the woman caught in the act of adultery, brought half naked to Jesus, and he loves her. And you've got the tax collector who's been robbing his own community out of money, and he loves him. You can't look at your life And go, boy, I can't love that neighbor. Because they left their trash can out two nights. I'm surprised the HOA didn't come along and find them. I can't love my coworker. Man, they keep ruining the movies, Fast and Furious. Come on, Dom. Like they ruined the ending. I hadn't even seen it yet. He ruined it. I can't love him. I can't love. You know, the people running this country. I can't love the people protesting and, you know, doing this or raising flags or waving their band. I can't love. If you have Jesus, the issue is not that you can't love people. Here's the issue is that you won't love people. The issue is not that you can't. The issue is you've got your eyes off Jesus and you're trying to self-justify your way of prejudice discrimination and hate and guess what god's not going to tolerate it jesus loved all people doesn't mean he agreed with all people doesn't mean he took certain topics to task with people he loved the religious people and they were the hardest people to love in his day and yet he loved them and it was a tough love because the people who should have known better weren't acting appropriately and accordingly. And so here's the example we have is that, you know what, we love all people. It doesn't mean you're not going to get displeased with people. It doesn't mean you're not going to get irritated by people. It's not that you're going to be exasperated by people. That's going to happen because we are human beings trying to live this life together on this journey that hopefully God wants, but you are called nonetheless to love. You love all people. And don't think I have attained this in my own life. I continue to learn and grow in this area and it and loving people i strongly disagree with but i'll tell you what you can disagree without being disagreeable and that itself is a form of love amen we live in a culture where whoever yells the loudest or whoever throws the first punch or has the best banner you know wins the game no i believe in what bill shakespeare wrote you know the pen is mightier than the sword amen that when you sit down and you can have an intelligent, reasonable, rational conversation with people, now even with those qualifiers, I've left half the population out, but just press on and do it. You love people and you gauge in conversation, and you know what? You're going to end up being a better person because of it. Which is why this new experience, the third point, is so important, because like I said to you before, it's not that you can't do it in Christ, it's that you won't do it in Christ. Because what God does now as your 
come into faith in Jesus, as you're being awakened to the love of Jesus in your own heart, there is a new experience that sets in, and now your life is set on a trajectory to love as Christ loved, and this is not of your own doing. This is because now you share a life with the author of all things. You share a life, and you're in union with him who is the author of love. And now God says, now that you know me, let me take over your heart. Let me have control of your affections and let me guide your steps so that you can love as Jesus loved. Because look at First John again. I don't want you to miss this. Verse 8. I am writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you. Notice, this is not just true in Christ. This is true in you if you're a follower of his. So there is the union there is the cooperation that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2 where we do on a daily basis work out our salvation with faith and trembling. We now cooperate with God and pray His will be done, not my own, and say, God, help me love my enemies. Help me love those I disagree with. Help me love those I have differences of opinion with. Help me love those that are not like me. Help me love those who have different ethics and values and morals. Why? Because which is true in him is now true in you. I love how John Piper talks about this. He says this, the gospel contains not only the commandment to trust Jesus, but also the commandment and the power of that trust to be changed into a loving person. Here's the power of the gospel that God makes us into the people we can never do for ourselves. God makes us into loving people. I'm going to tell you right now, one of the tests that I believe John is issuing is that if you're not growing into a loving person, you have not believed in the true gospel. If you have not grown into a more loving person, you're perhaps loving the wrong God. Because the power of God is not thwarted the power of the gospel cannot be overturned by your willingness to not be changed the reality of it is notice as he finishes verse 8 because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining meaning and i love this i'm glad john didn't say the light has already passed Notice that the, the, it is passing, meaning as you walk with Jesus, the person you say you know and love, the person that hung on the cross for your sins that you say you believe in, what ought to be true is because the power of the gospel and what Jesus did is that we are ever growing more and more into the light and getting out of the realms of darkness. Now, positionally, I do believe we have been thrusted from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen? Practically, we're passing. There's movement. Less darkness, more light. Isn't that awesome? Like, John's not saying you've got to have this thing all perfected. This is good for me because I need to be comforted with these words. The light is growing brighter and the darkness is fading as I continue to walk in the ways that reflect me knowing Christ, obeying God, and loving other people. What's the evidence? More light, less darkness. What's the evidence? More love, less hate. This is the new experience. Third point, the measure of love. So here's the big question. How do we measure this? What does this look like? Four points. Guess what? They're all E words. It's going to be easy. Oh, another word, E word. I love it. What's the letter today? Today's show is brought to you by the letter E. <laughs> the measure of love, verse 9. This, the one who says he is in delight and yet hates his brother... So John's getting very practical. You say you live in the light. Notice how much 
John is challenging verbal professions of faith. If you say you have no sin, if you say you live in the light, if you say you love your brother, right? We don't care about lip service. What we're concerned about, what Jesus is concerned about, is about actions. You say you love your brother, but you hate your brother. You're in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, lives in the light. There's no cause for stumbling in him. He doesn't cause anything for his own life to tri- be tripped up, and he doesn't cause anyone in his sphere of influence to be tripped up. Because when you live in the darkness, there's a lot of tripping. When you live in the light, you can see where you're going. This is obvious. Verse 11, but the one who hates his brother, again, practically everyday life, if you say you love your brother, but you hate your brother, that person is in the darkness, meaning that's where they live. They've never been truly saved. They really don't believe in Jesus. It's merely lip service. They walk in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded their eyes. So the question is, where are we at? Right? Here's a point of of self-examination. How am I doing in this context of love? Let me give you two examples, one negative, one positive. My mom's mom, my grandmother, who died 10 years ago, 12 years ago, she died a bitter, angry woman. She, um, I, would, I wouldn't tell you that the bitterness and anger happened because my mom died of cancer at the age of 39, and here's my grandmother burying her daughter. I mean, I can't even fathom that kind of loss and, and grieving. But my grandmother was always, as I can remember, a bitter, angry woman. I would take road trips with them, and and my memory of them uh, riding in their car, my grandfather always had like a Caprice Classic, this huge tank of a vehicle. Always smelled like handy wipes and breath mints, and it was the weirdest thing. And now I smell those things, and it triggers these these memories, right? And so I'd ride in the car, and, and my grandmother, whether it be in the car, whether it be in their home, was always complaining about people. Whatever was on the TV, whatever news story she's reading, whatever, she would always just talk so negatively about people. And then all of a sudden my mom passes away, and it was almost like that, that hate and that anger is exacerbated. And I remember one conversation with her on the phone, whereas God was just continuing to grow me in, this, in the way of Jesus, and we kept trying to find opportunities to share the love of Jesus with our grandparents, which is whenever you're trying to share Jesus with loved ones and family members, it is the most difficult task, is it not, church? So I'm on the phone with my grandmother. I go, Grandmother, I love you. And, there's m- and more than anything, I want you to know Jesus. But you know what? You need to understand that the bitterness and the anger has to, has to stop. And I spoke as a child of, of the woman who they had buried their daughter. And I said, you know, my mom loved Jesus. Your daughter loved Jesus. And he's the prince of peace. And he's the author of love. And I'm trying to talk. Because my grandmother was just so bent on hating people. And even in my reaching out to her, it was just such, it was so vitriolic and so full of vile, uh, vile words and a vile attitude. And she went to her grave as a, as a bitter, angry woman. And I sit there and I go, wow, what is it that takes place in the heart of a person? That it just, there's a hardening there. And then I think another example of another woman, an older woman on her deathbed, who I got a call as a pastor to go to the hospital. And what was amazing at St. Luke's Hospital downtown, how God broke through the anger in the heart of a woman to be reconciled with her daughter as she was ready to pass into eternity. And being in the room to see this this conversation happen between the the mom who's dying and the daughter who's sitting there, and there's, there's history of abuse, and there's history of neglect, and there's history of just unlove and ungrace. How God in that moment was working through the daughter and working through this pastor to let this woman know that she's got to let go of the anger. She's got to let God take over her heart. And, and as, as we're talking, as we're praying, boy, you see the countenance on this woman move from a place of resentment and hostility to a place of just surrender and, and hope. And she's crying and the daughter's crying and we're praying and talking. And moments later, this woman in this bed passes into eternity. And I will never forget that moment. Because these are the evidences of God working on someone's heart or not working on somebody's heart. 
I mean, are we growing into more loving people, forgiving people, accepting people? Or are we going to hold on to our, our resentments and our hostilities and the things that have really pissed us off over the years? Because, boy, I tell you what, I'm glad God doesn't treat us like that. I mean, God would come to you and go, you want to see the list of things I'm pissed off at you about? Here they are. And yet God says, let my kindness lead you to repentance. Let my love show you what a compassionate, forgiving, loving God that I am. If you say you love Jesus, that love for Jesus and his love for you transfers to a love of all people. No if, ands, buts, or whatevers. Four things. Here we go. Brought to you by the letter E. The extent of love. We should actually put some money on this. See who can guess the rest of the blank. The expression of love. Nope. The empowerment of love, or the empowerment to love. Notice that there's no entitlement. That's not the last one. You're not entitled to this. The last one is the endurance, the endurance of love. And I hope that these points will set us on a course to be a more loving people. Because hatred is insidious. Insidious. Hatred is... Uh, a, a sin that's really definitive of somebody that doesn't know Jesus. I mean, it's listed. It's, it's listed in, the, in the, 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 the evil character traits found in Galatians chapter 5. Read that this week. Hatred can be p- active and passive. See, we have to understand this, and this is where the, God's going to shine the light in our hearts. Hatred that is active, it's... it's it's pretty easy to detect, right? We can strike people, we can hit people, we can throw garbage in a neighbor's fence, we can mistreat somebody in a very sinister way, right? There's, there's tangible, demonstrable things we can sh- do to show hate towards somebody else. It's the passive hate we've got to be careful of. You know what passive hate looks like? Indifference. You know what passive hate looks like? It looks like isolation. It looks like coldness. It looks like exclusion. It looks like uh, um, unconcern for anybody else. And, you know, we can feign a facade of, of, of kindness, but inside, boy, who knows what's going on in the cauldron of this beast, right? And so Jesus always aims for the heart. I mean, even Jesus, with those who were taking him to be crucified, was praying for his enemies. He was loving those who were persecuting him. He's going before the Father saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That same spirit that prevailed in Christ and through Christ is available to us to be a more loving people. So four things. Number one, the extent of love. So here's the question. Who do I have to love? Jesus was posed this question, right? Like, hey, Jesus, who's my neighbor? Like somebody really want to get tit for tat and be like, please define for me who I need to love. And I sure hope it's not that person. Don't we all want lists like this? Like, here's the love list. Here's the can't stand list. Here's the list of people I get along with. We see eye to eye on everything. And then here's the list I just would love to just do without in my life. Jesus is not going to provide you with such list. Who's your neighbor? Let me tell you a story. The Good Samaritan. Here's a person who has just been robbed, beat up, left for dead. And all the people you thought would love him, the religious people, the spiritual people, the people with great ethics and morals, pass right by the other side of the street without lifting a hand to help the person in danger. And yet, the one person in the community that was laughed at, that was mocked at, that was scoffed at, that didn't have to lift a finger not only helps the person injured, but provides for their every need to be taken care of. So let's talk about who your neighbor is. Don't you love it? Jesus goes for the spiritual jugular. Who do you love? You love your enemies. It's easy to love those that are easy to love. 
but so much more difficult to love those that you cannot stand. Your response and attitude towards all people is evidence of your Christian character. And I'm going to tell you right now that Jesus' message was exclusive. He knew his sheep. He knew the part, the people that weren't part of his flock and fold, but his love was inclusive. Don't miss this. How does this transfer to the church? You don't just love church people. And I'm going to tell you, the person that tells me they just only love church people, I'm going to tell them they haven't been in church that long. I mean, I say this out of love. Some people, sometimes church people can be the worst. Right? There's a reason why the reputation of Christians is that they are the ones that shoot their wounded. I've been there. I've, I've done that. But I sit here and I go, yes, Jesus' message was very exclusive, but his love was for everybody. So, the real question is, who do I not have to love? Answer is, you have to love everybody. Okay? You have to love everybody. Amen. Some wise person said that, huh? Second point, the expression of love. A couple verses I want to hip you to right now. Awesome verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Check this out. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. We've been taught by God to love other people? You know why? Because of the Holy Spirit poured out within your hearts when you believe. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And there's one thing I know about one of the qualities of the Holy Spirit, of the, of the Son, of the Father, of the Trinity, is that they are about love. And now you are given the ability to love. You can express this love. Why? Because of the love that's been poured out within your heart. And so now the beauty of it is that Jesus is on location as promised in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And now his mediatorial role that we already looked at, that he's the, the mediator between us and, and the Father, is to enable such love. He's going to fuel it. And so why do we not express the love? Is because I don't think we're giving God an opportunity to really play it out in us. We're not cooperating with him. Colossians 3, one of the most powerful verses I can think of in these past few days. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. Paul says, clothe yourselves. Meaning, when you wake up in the morning, you get dressed. Thank you, everyone, for wearing clothes today. You guys did a good job, all right? You got dressed, so God says spiritually, clothe yourselves daily. Colossians chapter 3, he says, put on holiness, uh, compassionate, be compassionate, kind, hum humble, meek, patient, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against each other, forgive one another. And as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You have to cooperate with God to become this person. He's given you spiritual clothes. Put them on. And if you're worried about w looking good, let him make you look good in the clothes he's provided. Do I need to say that again? Rewind. Let him make you look good in the clothes that he's provided. You can put on the clothes, you let him do the glory. You do a little glory dance, not for you, for God, because people won't believe the kind of person you are because you can never produce that yourself. He's the one now expressing himself through you. Which brings us to our third point. You're empowered to do this. Because you go, I can't do it, I don't have the power to do it. You're right, you don't have the power to do it. That's why we are empowered to love by God. I love how one pastor friend phrased it. He said, there's a new commandment that requires a new obedience and can only happen because of a new spirit. And if God is able to work in you, let him work in you because all you are called to do is really abide in Christ. So what is the fruit you bear for abiding in Jesus? It's love. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the spirit of these. Love starts love. Most important thing, love. What's the law? The fulfillment of the law is love. Romans chapter 13. Read that passage this week. Awesome. 
love, the only debt you owe to other people is to love them unconditionally. That's what Paul says. This is the fulfillment of the law. So God empowers you to become the people he wants you to be. Can I tell you an awesome story this week? Uber driver. Who's taking Uber? No one's Uber. Sometimes you just need an Uber just to Uber and say you've Ubered, right? So in Florida this week, this Uber driver named Chad was ready to go home, and he thought to himself, nope, I'm going to hang out in the parking lot for about 10 minutes to see if I get, a, I get a call. He gets a call, picks up this guy. Now, as an Uber driver, you can only imagine the mystery of who your next passenger is going to be, right? <gasps> Tom Cruise? I don't know, maybe, you know. Just so you guys know, I did drive Tom Cruise around. I wasn't his Uber driver, but I was his chauffeur. Another story for another time. So Chad picks up this guy. He's ready to go home, but he goes, I'm going to wait for one more, one more ride. Gets the ride. Picks the guy up, and all, the guy, all of a sudden the guy told him where he wanted to go. And on his computer, it was the middle of a bridge that is known for people to jump off and kill themselves. And on their way to this bridge, the man is talking about how he'd just been diagnosed with cancer. And Chad said, there was just something in me that knew this wasn't a good situation. So they're talking, and the Uber driver pulls up to the toll booth, says to the woman in the toll booth what's going on. She redirects him down a hill to water level where there's other people hanging out. As he lets the guy go from the car, he says, hey, I'd love if I can get a selfie with you. And the guy's like, he goes, I just want to remember my passengers so I know how I can pray for the passengers I meet. So down by the river, they take a selfie. And the driver, Chad, says to this man, just so you know, I'm going to be praying for you. At that moment, he sends the picture off to the authorities so they know there's a, there's a risk situation going on. The cops pull up. This guy dives into the water. And he's under the water. And the cops go in after him. Pull him out, resuscitate him, bring him back to life. This guy, the driver, inadvertently saves this man's life. He's on NPR radio giving this interview this past week. Why? Because the man said, when I prepared for my day to be an Uber driver, I'm always wanting to be cognizant of the people that get in my car. Because I don't know where people are at. I don't know what's going on in their lives. And he goes, at this moment, and the interviewer from NPR is asking this guy, what, what just kind of hipped you onto this whole thing? And he's just like, I just had this awareness that God had a divine appointment for me at this moment to help this man. And this man is now alive. Why? Because some stranger showed him love. And even I wonder how the whole selfie thing, right? Like, this is an intriguing aspect. Like, I would love to take a picture with you so I know how to pray for you. Like, here's technology. Well, I'm so often apt to just poo-poo on technology, right, and to tell you how awful and evil it is. Perhaps it's, it's those very things that move us to a heart of compassion and kindness with people and say, can I get a picture with you just so I know how to pray for you? And I don't know what's going on in your world, and I know you must be haunted by demons and wrestling with a lot of frustration and confusion, but I want you to know no, I'm another human being in the journey. And this man's life has now saved as a result of this Uber driver that he didn't even know. Is that awesome or what? Can we begin to go about our days being aware of every single person around us, whether we know them or not? Can we begin to be more aware and cognizant of, of the fact that life is beating a lot of people up? In this room right now, there are a handful of people where life has got them on the ropes right now. And one more blow is going to put them on the mat. And yet, perhaps it's our unconditional love and kindness that we show to that person that pulls them off the, the, the ropes and says, life's worth li living. It's worth going on. Turn to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 right now. I'm going to close with this. Here are your marching orders. And here's the beauty of the endurance of love. Because love will win. Love will prevail. Love will conquer. I firmly believe this, right? 1 Corinthians 13. 
This is a, you guys know this passage, but the question is, do you know it? Because I'll tell you what, I could probably spend a whole message on it and, and show you how you don't know it, and I don't know it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I'm the most eloquent, persuasive, powerful speaker in the world and have not love, I'm no better than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can tell you supernatural truths that are not related to or or coming through any other person, but I am this messenger from on high that tells you mysteries and knowledge. And if I have all faith to move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. You can fill in the blank. If I go to school and get this many degrees, if I go out and I buy this many houses, if I go out and become the coach of of all my children's soccer teams and, and then some, fill in the blank. If you think you're loving through all those things you do but have not a heart of love, it amounts to zilch. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. How often does love fail? Never. (laughs) It never fails. Stop being arrogant, rude, irritable, resentful, insistent on your own way. Stop rejoicing when others stumble. Live in the light and let the love of Christ compel you to love others. Be a kind and patient person with everyone. Have, have, have you uh, forgiven those who've sinned against you? If not, forgive them. Do you serve the least of my brothers, as Jesus said? And are you serving them as Jesus would himself serve them? Then do it. Are you bearing all things? Are you believing all things? Are you hoping all things? Are you enduring all things? This is the way of love. And lest we forget the greatest demonstration of love is what God has done for us through Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son that anyone who would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Do you have that? Then you have no excuse to go out and love all people. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, this is, from a, from, a, from a fleshly perspective, this is a tall order. It would just seem like everything is set against me and my brothers and sisters here to live a life like we've just described. But yet you're a God of the impossible. You're a God whose love is invincible. You're a God who empowers your people to live in ways that are oftentimes remarkable and unexplainable. And Lord, we don't know how to do it or, or even to get the power to do it, but our call today is to lean on you heavily. 
And as we have surrendered our lives and our souls to you to to save us from the very flames of hell, Lord, I would pray that that power that has rescued us from damnation would set us on a course towards healing and restoration and reconciliation and forgiveness. We who have claimed the name of Jesus, would we not just profess our love for him, but would we show it to all people? Lord, forgive us for being unloving and unkind. We have been a stumbling block for people. And I pray that you have spiritually opened our eyes to a different way. May we help and not hinder. May we love and grow less and less in our hate as evidence of the birth we've received in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, the lover of all lovers. Thank you for pouring that love out within our hearts. We praise you for giving us hope and new life. Thank you for this time together. Help us to live in ways that we can never do ourselves. We're leaning on you, God. We need you. The world needs this kind of love. Help us to be those vehicles of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon, all right?